Uh, welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Jason Freeman. I work here in Author Events, and it is my pleasure to be here tonight to introduce Barbara Bradley Haggerty. Uh, journalist Barbara Bradley Haggerty was an NPR reporter for nearly 20 years, first covering the Jones of faith, politics, law, science, and culture. She twice received the American Women in Radio and Television Award, was selected for a Templeton Cambridge Journalism Fellowship in Science and Religion, um, and attended Yale, school, uh, Yale Law School on a Knight Fellowship. Uh, her New York Times bestseller, Fingerprints of God, explores the scientific discoveries about the ways faith affects our brains. Uh, her new book is called Life Reimagined, the Science, Art, and Opportunity of Midlife. Using emerging information from neurology, genetics, sociology, other disciplines, as well as her own very compelling story, tonight's author rethinks the conventional wisdom regarding the possibilities, purposes, and pleasures of what we used to call middle age. Here to tell you more, ladies and gentlemen, won't you please join me in welcoming Barbara Bradley Haggerty to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Um, Thank you so much for having me here tonight. And it's really an honor to be here. I've heard a lot about the Philadelphia Free Library and I'm really delighted that I was invited. And I'm gonna, I'd, I'd love to kind of talk to you tonight about navigating through midlife. And I'll tell you a few stories, a couple of stories, and I'll try to offer a few insights. And after about 30 minutes or so, I'd just like to hear your questions because I actually think that is the most fun part of any presentation. <laughs> so um, let me just begin at the beginning. What prompted me to research and write a book about midlife? So a few days before Memorial Day in 2011, Marianne Bradley, my mother, was 89 years old and she was living independently in her apartment in Washington, DC. And my brother David and I would call mom every single day. I'd call in the morning and he would call in the evening. And on one particular day, mom didn't quite sound like herself. So my brother David went over to her apartment and there he found mom w in bed with the New York Times and the Washington Post spread in front of her as usual. But it was clear that something was wrong. So we took her to the hospital and they quickly realized that mom had had a stroke. And in a few days, my mom was, un in a few hours, my mom fell unconscious. So over the next few days in the ICU, mom slipped in, in and out of consciousness. It wasn't at all clear that she would ever re regain consciousness permanently, nor was it ever clear that she would actually speak again. This for me was a real tragedy because mom is the wisest person I know. She's, she's my best friend. And she would help me, she was so articulate in kind of thinking through every kind of dilemma and, and figuring out, navigating the way to go with her impeccable moral compass. And the idea that mom would never speak again was just a tragedy. So one day, probably five days into this, um, after a long day at the hospital, I was making dinner with my husband, Devin, and it was this perfect evening in late May. I mean, the, the flowers were blooming, the, the trees were that wonderful shade of green. Um, it's my per it's a, perfect, a perfect evening, a soft golden evening in my favorite time of year, spring, when summer is about to come and just life is bursting. And I felt nothing. I felt completely flat. I didn't feel a shiver of happiness. I didn't feel any delight about the coming summer, which is my, my favorite time of year. I just felt flat. And I looked at my husband, who was slicing a tomato, and I said, you know, Devin, I think I'm having a midlife crisis. And he put down the tomato, and he looked at me, and he said, don't do that. Please don't have a midlife crisis. So mom's stroke was the spark for a combustible collection of small despairs that I was, that were just essentially waiting to ignite. And you know, from a clinical point of view, it seems like a pretty irrational thing to, to feel flat. I mean, I had and have a great marriage. I have a great family. I, have a, I had a great job at NPR. I was fairly healthy. And yet I felt kind of flattened by the unremitting dailiness of work, um, by, kind of minor but unnerving health scares by the suspicion that this, I was 51 at the time, that this is as good as it gets and then life begins this long, slow, depressing descent. So 
The next morning after the tomato incident, I got up early to see whether in fact I was having a midlife crisis. Is this what I was having? If so, was there anything I could do about it? Could I avoid having a midlife crisis? I mean, after all, my impression was that everyone has one, right? I mean, Lester Burnham in the, American, in the movie The American Beauty, um, everyone's replacing their older model spouse for a younger model, everyone's getting a red sports car, right? It turns out that may not be true. That's what I found in my first few minutes. So I, in the next few minutes, I wanna talk with you about one myth, one truth, and one recommendation regarding midlife. So the myth. The idea and the term midlife crisis comes from an obscure journal article that was written in 1965 by a Canadian psychoanalyst named Elliot Jocks. The article was called Death in the Midlife Crisis, and Jocks said that in midlife, a man, and he only studied men, begins to glimpse the shadow, slanting shadows of death and suddenly recognizes that he will long be gone before he can realize all of his dreams and aspirations. A few years later, Daniel Levinson from Yale picked up the theme, and after interviewing 40 men in depth, again, only men, Levinson concluded that 80%, 80% of men suffer from a midlife crisis. Then Gail Sheehy came along, she wrote passages, and suddenly a cultural phenomenon was born and there was no turning back. The problem was, researchers began to look, and they looked and they looked, and they could not find evidence of an inevitable or a common midlife crisis. They ended up, after talking to hundreds and hundreds of people in depth, they concluded that perhaps 10% of people feel this sort of existential angst about age, aging and, and dreams dying, and that 90% of people really don't have a midlife crisis. So that's the myth. And if you are thinking about quitting your job or quitting your marriage, you can do that. But what I wanna tell you is that you can't blame that on the inevitable midlife crisis, okay? <laughs> the truth. The truth is that something is going on. I mean, as reassuring as debunking the myth of the midlife crisis was, it didn't quite ring true to me. I mean, don't your 40s and 50s and 60s feel different from your 20s and 30s? I mean, don't, don't things feel a little bit flatter, like the colors aren't quite as vivid and the roses don't smell quite as lovely even if you did bother to stop and smell them? Doesn't, doesn't it feel different now? And if your answer to that is yes, then I want to assure you that you're not delusional. Something is going on in your 40s and 50s. And while midlife crisis is not all that common, midlife ennui, that flat feeling, that is almost universal. For 20 years, economists have surveyed people around the world in 75 different countries, and they found that everyone, rich and poor, educated or not, living in a war zone or living in you know, Sweden, everyone suffers a dip in happiness in middle age. In the US, the average age for your nadir is 45. It's 40 for women and 50 for men. And it's called the U-curve of happiness, where people feel really upbeat and optimistic when they're young and life feels so ascendant and there are so many challenges and new things that you're learning. And then people kind of slope down into discontentment in their 40s and early 50s before they swoop up again, growing happier and happier right through their 70s. So it's this U-curve. So how, how do you reconcile the myth of a universal midlife crisis with the reality of a ubiquitous midlife doldrum? And it really comes down to the difference between happiness in the moment and fulfillment in the long term. So what the economists were doing when they were taking these surveys is they were asking people about momentary happiness. Are you happy today? Are you stressed today? And most people at this stage of life, are between around 45 and 65, they're not out partying with friends at night, right? They're taking care of kids and possibly aging parents. They have mortgages and college tuitions to think about. They have heavy responsibilities at work. So in that moment, no, they're not giddy with happiness, but that's not the kind of existential question at the center of midlife cr crisis. The important question is, is your life meaningful? Are you fulfilled? 
And the majority of middle-aged people say that yes, they are fulfilled, life is meaningful. Now before I move on to the recommendation, I wanna make one other distinction, and that is there is a world of difference between midlife crisis, which is rare, and a crisis at midlife, which is common. Back in 2013, when I was just beginning the research on this book, NPR sent a, a call out on its Facebook page. How's midlife treating you, it asked. And we received something like 700 responses in just a few hours. They were beautiful little masterpieces, these essays about the ups and downs of, of midlife. It was wonderful. And there were a few people who saw you know, who saw their knees sagging and they felt that time was slipping away and they weren't going to be able to fulfill their dreams. There was one woman who quit her job after reading Eat, Pray, Love, saying that she wanted to get her smile back. Um, another person left her husband, traveled the U United States on a motorcycle before moving in with a girlfriend in San Francisco. But there weren't very many of those. There were, however, a fair number of people who were really, really struggling. And it was mainly because they had lost their jobs after 2008 and they were having trouble finding another. I began to think, I'm not sure I believe it's true, but I began to think when I was reading these e emails that 55 is the new 65. It's really hard. It's a struggle to get a job if you've lost it. Now, if you are in that boat, a psychologist would say that you are not having a midlife crisis. What the psychologist would say is that you are suffering a crisis at midlife. And midlife is chock full of crises. Losing a job, losing a spouse, losing a parent, you go through a divorce, you have a health scare or something worse. But those are external events and they can happen at any time. The trauma isn't about death, it's about circumstances. And studies find this, once the crisis is over, people generally return to their happiness set point. I kept in touch with a lot of these people that it had written into me um, from those 700 emails. And what I found, found was that with very few exceptions, everyone found another job. It wasn't immediately as well paying, but they found another job. And what I also noticed is they kind of rebounded and they, became, they were back to their chipper selves or happier selves. So if you think that you're having a midlife crisis based on external circumstances, I would just say, be patient. It'll probably get better. Now for the recommendation. Here's something that really happy midlifers do. This is their secret. They tend to revise their expectations and find meaning in the way their lives have actually worked out. So I saw this again and again. You know, not everyone can be a CEO. Not everyone can be a pitcher for the Phillies. So you reconcile yourself to that. I mean, life isn't pretty. I would be we would all, you know, laugh. You'd laugh in my face if I told you that life is e midlife is easy and pretty. It is a complicated time. But people who thrive at midlife, they take the bad with the good. And they don't really stress over their wrinkled skin. They tend to laugh about their synapses firing a little bit more slowly. Maybe they laugh a little bitterly, but, you know, they, they tend to laugh. Um, they may cringe over forgetting, briefly forgetting a colleague's name but it doesn't send them into this existential funk. The people who thrive let go of what they've lost and they fo focus on what they do have. Scientists call it the socio-emotional selectivity theory. So as people see their time horizon shrink, they focus on what's really important to them. And that's almost always two things, other people who are close to them and causes near to their hearts. That's the pivot that happy people begin to make at midlife. It's a reorientation about what's important, what matters. So when people do that, what happens is they big, begin to swoop up that lovely U-curve of happiness. I wanna tell you one more secret to flourishing. And this one insight, I hope, um, maybe, it might change your life, no matter how old you are. I know it changed mine. It really, really changed the way I look at things. So on May 6, 2013, I followed a woman named Julie Schneider into a chilly, spotless room. Schneider is a neuropathologist at Rush University Medical Center, and her job is to examine the brains of dead people. We walked into what's called a dirty lab and laid out on a tray like cauliflower 
the little slabs of cauliflower about to be popped into the oven, were the slices of a, uh, slices of a brain of a woman named Marge. Schneider waved me over and, and held up a slice of a brain really close to my face to let me examine it, something I must confess I wasn't exactly eager for her to do. And she pointed out this white area of the brain. And she said she thought it was a plaque within a blood vessel. She thought that Marge might have Alzheimer's disease. So after a bit, we left the dirty lab and looked at Marge's brain under a microscope. And what we saw were the telltale plaques and tangles of intermediate level Alzheimer's disease. But here's the thing. Marge had never shown a single symptom of dementia, not a single symptom. Marge was part of a study that's about 20, 20, years old, 20 years old now. It's called the Rush Memory and Aging Project. And every year, scientists uh, and researchers from Rush University visit hundreds of healthy, healthy older people in retirement homes, basically people 60 and older. They give them a battery of cognitive and psychological tests, and they do this every year until a participant has died, and then they autopsy the brain. That's part of part of the thing that they've agreed to. So the Rush University uh, researchers have performed hundreds of autopsies at this point, and they have found that fully one-third of people whose autopsies showed they had the plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's disease never showed symptoms when they were alive, a third of the people. They displayed no memory loss, no confusion, no disorientation, no personality changes, no change in their cognitive scores. For example, Marge aced all of her cognitive exams right up to her death at age 87, and yet she had Alzheimer's. People like Marge are called escapees. So what do these people do differently when they were alive? And how can we up our chances of escaping dementia? That's what the researchers at Rush University wanted to know. And they had a lot of, actually a lot of information to try to figure it out. They could look back and they could see what traits or habits or lifestyle patterns, psychological traits, seemed to protect people from losing their mem memories even though they had the disease. So let me just ask you here, I mean, what do you think? What habits or lifestyles or psychological traits do you think would prevent people, would protect people from showing the signs of dementia? Anyone? Uh, wait, okay, one at a time. Exercise, did someone say? Uh-huh, anything else? Socialization, social network is really good. Purpose. Purpose, yep, very good. Friendships, great. Reading, Reading is big, yep. Learning a new skill. Did anyone listen to my, my interview today with <laughs> on WHYY? You guys are getting all the right things. One person actually, one person actually hit it, um, and that is um, there's one trait that seemed to have more impact than any other thing, and that trait is called purpose in life. Who's, who said purpose? Yeah, well done. Okay, purpose in life. And I didn't even talk about that, I think, uh, so wow. So people who have a reason to get up in the morning are far, far less likely to show the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, even though they have the disease. And Rush, Rush researchers found that people with low purpose in life are two and a half times more likely to lose their memory to Alzheimer's disease than those with a high sense of purpose. It's not a perfect defense, right? Uh, two thirds of people do get, with Alzheimer's, do show symptoms of Alzheimer's. But I really take heart in knowing that there is a mindset, there's an approach to life that can actually up our chances of preserving our memories, no matter what our brains do. So purpose in life is kind of, I think of it as the, the Cinderella of research. No one really noticed purpose in life until recently, but now everyone thinks that she is really, really attractive. <laughs> Right. And that is in part because of a great project called Midlife in the United States, which is centered in the, at the University of Wisconsin. It's turned out hundreds and maybe at this point, you know, thousands of scientific papers about you know, what makes for a healthy midlife. And studies show that people with purpose in life live longer, are less likely to have a stroke or a heart attack. They spend a lot less time in, ho in hospital as well as preserving their memories. And now, what's really cool is that in Denmark, um, studies in Denmark show that purpose 
not purpose in life, but purpose is the single largest factor in being happy in your job. More than twice as important as the runner-up factor, which was having good leadership. So believing your job has meaning, that your job itself, you have meaning in your job, or that your organization has a strong mission, like NPR, like the Philadelphia Free Library. That is more important than having good leadership or having lots of recognition at work or having a good work-life balance. It is by far the most important thing. So what does that mean for us, right, on this side of the autopsy? What does it mean for people in the thick of midlife? It means that for many of us, all things being equal, living with purpose will, make, will do more to make you flourish physically and emotionally and cognitively than almost anything else. So what do I mean by purpose? Really, it can be almost anything. It can be really big. It can be work, your kids, your family, your church, a cause, a political campaign. It could be small. It could be a hobby. It could be learning Spanish. Four years ago, um, I could barely walk up a flight of stairs because I had arthritis in my right knee. And that was really tough on me because I'd been a lifelong runner and it was kind of central to my identity. So I started spinning and cycling. Um, spinning in the winter, cycling in the, in the summer. And, and uh, I, then a friend challenged me to try to qualify for the National Senior Games, which is for P athletes 50 and older. That challenge actually gave me a, what I call a little purpose. It gave me a passion. It gave me a goal to strive for. Can I do a 50-mile ride today? Can I do those intervals faster? Can I place in that race? It gave me little victories. When I was training, I often thought of something that a woman named Kathy Uchschneider said to me. She teaches at Boston College, and she coaches a lot of midlife athletes. And she said, you know, when you're young, you had a lot of markers. <clears throat> you graduate from high school, graduate from college, you get married, you start a family, you launch a career, and then you hit midlife. And it goes on and on and on. She said Mid midlife is kind of like a book without punctuation. There are a whole lot of words, but there aren't a whole lot of paragraphs or commas or periods or semicolons. And she said, you know, what, what having a goal, a little purpose or a big purpose is, what it does is it gives you victories. It puts the punctuation back in your life, whether it's something as important as raising terrific children or learning Spanish so you can travel through Mexico. Purpose in life is not the elixir, but it is really, really close. And I know that it changed my life. I want to um, just finish by noting that when I started my research in 2011, I was actually pretty worried that it was all going to go downhill from there. I was briefly relieved that I didn't have to have a midlife crisis because, gosh, that seemed like an awful lot of effort. And I just wasn't sure I wanted to put out like that. But as I marched through the research, I realized that there's a difference between surviving at midlife and thriving in midlife. So how do you thrive? And my book tackles that question from various angles. I've kind of talked to you a little bit about the purpose in life angle, but how do you thrive in a long marriage? How do you keep your midlife brain sharp? How do you avoid getting bored with or coming to resent your career in the middle of it, of it which I have to tell you happens to the vast majority of people in their 40s and 50s? I interviewed more than 400 people for this book, and many of them were researchers. And then I realized that I had a key answer right in front of me the whole time, from the beginning. So let's go back to May of 2011. My mom had been moved to the stroke unit at George Washington Hospital. It's Memorial Day at this time, and the neurologist walks in, trailed by a half a dozen students. Mom had not spoken a word. She had been mute this whole time. And the neurologist says, Mrs. Bradley, you know, I just want to do a couple of tests. Um, she gestured toward the window. Do you see those green things on the trees out there? What do you call those green things? Mom looked out the window and she looked kind of worried. She looked back and she shrugged. And that's okay, Mrs. Bradley, don't worry about that, she, the doctor assured her. What, but let me just ask you, see those things going down the road? What do you call those? 
Mom looked out the window and looked at the cars, and then she shrugged again. My brother said, ask her what her favorite Sunday morning talk show is. Mrs. Bradley, what is your favorite Sunday morning talk show? Freed Zakaria GPS, she said her very first words after the stroke. <laughs> Not waiting, missing a beat. So, you see, mom couldn't care less about gardens, never, never cared about gardens. She wasn't very interested in cars, because she hadn't driven for a few years. But she reads the New York Times and the Washington Post cover to cover every single day. So something like foreign affairs at that time, the Arab Spring, the mission to capture Osama bin Laden, these events engaged her, which is why Fareed Zakaria's name just sliced right through the aphasia. And in a few weeks, mom had fully recovered. Her memory and her name recall are better than my brother's and mine. I, seriously, I never debate her on a foreign policy issue because she always has a nuanced argument. I just don't even try. Mom probably had a good kind of stroke, a brain bleed that the doctors were able to stem bef before it caused lasting da damage. But you know, the stroke experts who worked with mom don't believe it was just luck. Her primary speech therapist at National Rehab Rehabilitation Hospital told me that mom was a career-changing patient. She said that most of the, octo well, all of the octogenarians that she worked with didn't really look forward to things, they generally looked back and with sadness and regret at what they had lost. Mom looked ahead. She looked forward to going to Nantucket where she had a house. She looked forward to seeing her kids every day. She looked forward to reading the New York Times. She was completely engaged in life. And that, the therapist said, made her a miracle patient. So here's the insight for us. One of the secrets to thriving at midlife and beyond is engagement. So like my favorite takeaway, which my editor didn't really like because he thought it was too negative, but I think it's good. Okay, so my favorite takeaway from all this research is autopilot is death. If you coast through midlife, if you take your job or your marriage or your kids or your health for granted, that is a recipe for a serious funk. So pick up a new hobby. Go on an RV trip with your spouse, which I did with my husband. Um, pivot on your career. Whatever part of your life you care about, invest in it. Become engaged. And what I realized in the end is that I could have saved a lot of time and money just by observing my mother. Thank you. It's easy to say everyone should have a purpose, but for many of us, we today see middle age and plus people who seem to have no purpose and can't break out of the shell to go to a Spanish class or to sign up for exercise. And it always makes you feel so bad when you see your friends with no purpose. What can you do? Wow. Well, let me just ask you a follow-up question on that, if I might. Are these people who are just so crazy busy at work that they just don't have time? They're retired. That's a really interesting question. Um, no one has ever asked me that question. Let me just think, how would I approach this if I saw someone who was not engaged, um, didn't seem to have a hobby? Well, what I would, I guess what I would do, here's one of the things that um, people do when they, when they find hobbies, often, or little purposes, often what it is is something that they really loved doing as a child or that they always wanted to do. So, for example, if your friend loved to play the flute as a child, um, I interviewed a woman who w loved the flute as a child and right through high school, and then dropped it when she got to college and all of that. And then at 50-something, her kids started taking music classes, and she picked it up again. It gave her this whole view, brand new kind of look at life. She felt young again. So what, one thing I would do is I would ask that person, walk back with me to your childhood. What did you really, really love doing? Um, did you love watching baseball? Did you love scoring you know, baseball games? What was your passion? My husband, you know, my husband was a fanatic about baseball, and he rediscovered it when the Nats came to Washington. Um, and so I guess one thing I would do is 
I mean, it's no good nagging someone, but if you can engage them on what they loved doing, what they always wanted to do, perhaps that will prompt them to, to take a step or two. Are there different levels of purpose, like um, there's the purpose to change the world and then there's the purpose to learn the flute? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I, I think, I mean, obviously there are, there are diver, different levels in terms of kind of the impact on the world. Um, I am sp I'm not speaking from research here. Uh, it's observational. I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure it matters what the purpose is as long as you have a reason to get up in the morning. So Marge, for example, whose brain, you know, I, I saw up front and up close and personal. Um, her purpose was she was a big reader. And she actually um, had a really bad back and she had a hard time getting out of, out of bed or walking around a lot. And her, chill, her husband had died and all of this. And so what she did, what she loved to do is she would, she would read and every week the library would send her a box of books. And what she would do is she would, um, she would read an entire box of books and talk to people about it. People would come over and she would have like these little salons about it and talk to her sister about it. That's not a change your world purpose, but it really, it, it preserved her memory. Um, so, you know, sometimes I think about that because I have friends who actually are doing so much good to the, for the world um, that I knew when they were, they're, you know, younger than I am, a woman named Laylee Miller um, Murrow who started Tahereh uh, Justice Center, helps immigrant women and children um, escape violence, right, and come to the United States. That is a really, really large purpose. I'd like to have that purpose. Unfortunately, you know, that isn't my purpose, but if I can do it in small ways by investing in younger people, mentoring, you know, doing other things, it's, it's good enough for me. So I think, I think you just have to choose what you really love to do and do yes, it. Yes, hi, thanks for coming. Uh, I wanted to know what you know about psychotropic drugs because it seems to me that a lot of people that are retired um, and or are in midlife are, um, are using um, antidepressants. Mm. And I'm wondering you know, how, how in fact that affects the outcomes um, for some of the people that you've studied and in fact is that a phenomenon that you've seen too? In fact, actually that's a really good question and I don't have an answer to it because that's not something I actually studied. It f it's amazing that it never came up with all the research I, I talked to. But, um, but that never, that absolutely never came up. So, well, there's one way it, uh, it, it does come up, and this wasn't in an interview, but it was in looking at the research um, uh, about exercise, actually. Uh, exercise is basically the best thing you can do for your brain. It's, it's shocking how good it is for your brain. But it's also really good for depression. And so in a lot of exercise, people have done all these studies on, on exercise, and what they have found is that it is as good as antidepressants uh, for, for major, let's see, not major depression, but non-major depression. It's as good as antidepressants, and uh, as well as just making you healthy and all of that. But that is the only way that that issue, I even saw it mentioned. Thank you. Now I know what to do. I need to be prepared. I'm going to look that up. Good evening. Thank Hi. you for uh, coming to Philadelphia and uh, being with us. Um, I'm a Greek Orthodox priest, so don't hold that against me. But as, as a priest, um, one of the issues that, that I'm interested in is the, the difference between faith and neuroscience. Hmm. Several years ago, I read a book uh, called uh, A General Theory of Love that I, I don't know if you're familiar with it. Yeah. Uh, it was by like three doctors, I don't know the name, but, but um, as, I, as I hear you talking and I think about these things and, and the whole idea about purpose is, um, is a good thing, I also am looking at the neuroscience of what goes on in the brain scientifically that doesn't necessarily have to do with the psychology. I mean, there's a connection. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if this is, is something for, for tonight or something for later on, but I don't know if you could speak to the difference between, say, faith and neuroscience in your studies and research and 
how they might be connected. So my first book actually kind of looked at this. I didn't look at this at all. Um, I actually, in my book proposal, had a chapter on what I called uh, mid-faith crisis, because I actually think faith is very much kind of mirror, mirrors a long relationship like a, with a spouse, where there's a honeymoon period and then and then it's hard, it's just harder, right? And it's not quite as, there's not as many fireworks and all of that. Uh, I ended up taking that out because it wasn't like any of the other chapters. So, but my first book, Fingerprints of God, actually kind of did look at this issue of, of faith and neuroscience. And I'm not sure I'm gonna precisely answer, I'm not sure exactly, let me, if I might just talk a little bit because I'm not sure I'm gonna exactly answer your question, but, um, one of the big issues that I had to grapple with, and one of the reasons I did this book, was is there any evidence that there's more than this, this human existence, this material world? Um, and after interviewing and talking to so many people about spirituality, and I'll, I'll say spirituality, I won't say faith, but you know they may be interchangeable, um, talking to a lot of neuroscientists and biologists and everything else, geneticists, but mainly neuroscientists, I came to the conclusion that um, how, whether you believe there is something more than this really depends on whether you think of the brain as, um, as a radio or a CD player. So a neuroscientist, someone who doesn't believe in anything more than this, would say that the brain is like a CD player and um, the music you hear, hear playing on the CD or messages from God, or this, not messages, but this sense of a connection with something higher or different or non-material, that once you change the brain chemistry, once you, once you, you know, give certain drugs or whatever, then that sense of connection with God or whatever, um, once you quiet the epileptic seizures, for example, that sense goes away and there really was no God because God was just a matter of brain chemistry, right? Um, and then, um, but if you think that, that the brain is more like a radio, then you can destroy the radio, but the content isn't in the radio. The content is elsewhere. Um, and what you hear coming out of Studio 2A at, at NPR isn't destroyed when you, when you alter the radio. And so, I don't know if I've gone any, even in the zip code of what you were talking about. Am I even close? Do you want me to tap dance? What would you like me to do? Am I close? <laughs> or do you want to refine your question or re-ask it or something? I just wanted to speak to that. I mean, the place of the, I like the idea of purpose, but I also understand, especially over the past few years, this relationship between faith and how the brain actually works on a physical right. basis, right? Um, uh, I'm just extremely interested. You know, they, they, they found the God gene or something right. recently. Now, the question is whether the God gene is there. And so, like, my best friend grew up with, has he doesn't have a religious bone in yeah, his right, body. Right. We're best friends today. Yeah. Here I am as a priest, right? right. Did that have happened because of the brain? Um, so it was, it was, it's basically, it was an open-ended question. So you, you, right. did, you, did, you did great. Okay. It's not a direct question. It's like, speak to yeah. that issue. Yeah. Well, and what I would say just about the God gene, A, it's like less than 1% of the difference in, in one's spiritual inclinations. But the other thing I'd say is, you know, some people are, some people are more naturally artistic. Some people are more naturally musical. Some people are more precise, like accountants. Some people are more open to these numinous experiences. And no one, I mean, happily, neither side, neither the very religious nor the very uh, unreligious, neither side can prove their case as a slam dunk. Neither can say there is a God or there is not a God. Some people are, are inclined to be more spiritual than others. And so I do think that there is a genetic and biological component to one's openness, just as there's a genetic and biological component to one's, um, you know, proclivity toward accounting, right? Um, I don't have a question. I guess I have an observation. Um, 
I think that uh, certainly nowadays we all live longer than mm. we've ever lived before. Right. And uh, re very closely related to that is therefore we work a lot longer than we've ever yeah. worked before. And I think sometimes, uh, I can remember back in graduate school, people would tell you in, in certain classes that uh, you know people will change their career you know, five, six, seven times in their life. And I thought, really, five yeah. or six, seven times? And I don't know a lot of people who have done that. Um, I haven't. And I, so for a lot of us, I think we've, we, we find ourselves all of a sudden approaching you know, many, many decades mm -hmm. of doing similar kinds of work. And I think that sometimes yep. gets the, the sense of purpose yep. uh, a, little, a little dull or right. faded or out of focus. And that maybe what we need to do is challenge ourselves to find something that's new and different. You're, you are so spot on. Um, the, the actual, the statistics are really disturbing. Um, Gallup has looked at this every year from like, I think 2000. Uh, they survey thousands, tens of thousands of people about their happiness at work or their engagement at work. And what they found is that only a third of people and uh, only a third of baby boomers and Gen Xers, so middle-aged people, are actually engaged in their work. And almost one out of five baby boomers are actively disengaged. That means they really don't like their jobs, right? And so the question is, why is that? And the reason is, generally, um, when they talk to people, the reason is generally that people in middle age feel that they're, they're not being challenged. They've been doing the same thing for a long time. They're not getting the new opportunities that the millennials are getting. They have responsibilities at work, so they, at home, and so they can't just leave their jobs, right? And they feel trapped, and they're unhappy, and they're scared to do anything about it, and with good reason. You know, it is scary out there. So then the question becomes, um, what do you do about that? And I actually looked really hard at that because I myself, um, a, a kind of a mid-career change was forced upon me by my vocal cords, uh, actually. Uh, it's rather inconvenient when a NPR reporter gets a partially paralyzed vocal cord and can't speak for days or weeks at a time. And, um, and that's what happened to me. And then the chronic pain in 2012 set in uh, and life became unbearable under stress. I hope you don't mind me just taking this quick divergence, but I will come back to your, your issue because it's actually relevant. Um, and so uh, my brother has this as well. My brother got it in 1998, 1996. I didn't get the initial problem until 2009 and then the chronic pain in 2012. And I don't know, does anyone here have chronic pain? It kind of dominates your life wouldn't you say? Um, at least it dominated mine, and it would soar on deadline, and it would soar at the prospect of deadline. Now, when you go to NPR every day, there is always a prospect of deadline, right? <laughs> there is always a chance you'll be uh, crashing on air that day. And what I realized is that it was unsustainable, um, and I am getting to your point. What I realized, it was unsustainable, and so I got this book contract, actually, so that I could step away from the daily news business and see what would happen to the chronic pain. And if I kind of reduce the stress, whether that would reduce as well. And in fact, um, it did help a lot. It helped an awful lot. In fact, so much that when NPR offered a buyout, I had to go back and think, can I, can I actually sustain, at that point, you know, I was, let's see, 2013, so I was 53. Can I sustain another at least 12 more years of that? Is that doable? And the answer was no. There is a really brilliant um, psychologist who helps people in midlife uh, think about their career changes. His name is Carlos Strenger. And uh, he's, in, he's in Israel. And he said, you know, if a job isn't quite right for you, often two, one of two things will happen. Either you'll leave the job or the job, your body will make you leave the job. And that's what happened with me. So OK. So this is why I was keenly interested in this question. You're at midlife. You feel for whatever reason, either boredom or feeling trapped or whatever, that your life, that your, your work is not satisfying or sustainable. So what do you do? 
and I looked at that. And here's what people do. Um, one is they think, they look deeply at themselves, at their strengths, their passions, what they love doing, what they hate doing, what they're bad at doing, what they're good at doing, right? They look at that, because they have enough biography by the time you're 50, you know, you know what you're good at and you know what you're not good at. And, and they figure, and they look at that and they go, okay, now how can I pivot in my career such that I am using my strengths and you, more of my strengths and less of the stuff I'm not good at? How do I do that? And often it's within a company. It's all, you don't have to leave your job often. So I have a very good friend um, who is the national editor at NPR, and it wasn't sustainable for him. He hated management. He, he hated it. He liked to edit. He liked to be close to the story. Well, he, he pivoted. He went back to editing. He is happy as a clam. It's not always that you go, have to go up the ladder. You have to kind of look and say, wait, is that really the right way for me to go? Or are there other things? Can I scan the horizon and see what, what's what I would do well and what would be sustainable? And then what some other people do is they um, they dip the toe in their water. So they may take a class. I interviewed an investment banker who went to divinity school um, and finished that up and got a job as a minister before he left uh, before he left um, the investment banking world. Or you might you might work, help pro bono, volunteer pro bono for a place that you really like to see if you want to do that kind of thing. So what you see is this kind of encore career movement where people are really rethinking, given the new math of midlife, given that we probably won't be able to retire at 65 or 60 the way our parents did, given that math, the question is what do you want to do instead of just holding on? What do you want to do that's purposeful that gets you out of bed every day, that uses your strengths. How can, you, how can I pivot and do that? And there's this whole movement that's really about that for baby boomers. So sorry for the long digression about myself, but um, I was going through this as well. Um, what is the organization that you joined um, when you were cycling? Was it cycling and spinning? Uh, so I, I, yeah, I mean, I went to a gym, but there was the um, National Senior Games. Is that what you're referring to? Yes, yeah, for athletes 15 and older. Are you going to do something? What are you going to do? I just think I do, I, I tend to work out very independently, and Excellent. I think it'd be fun to just be with a group. So what is it again? Nat it's called the National Senior Games. It's kind of known as the Senior Olympics because it's loosely affiliated with the U.S. Olympic Committee. And you won't believe how competitive these people are because I actually did qualify and I actually did compete in cycling. And... These women, I mean, they, I felt like I was, I looked down as we began, as we were kind of lined up for the cycling race, I was in the 55 to 59 category, and I felt like I was looking at, you know, a delta force only women, right? These long, ropey muscles, and, you know, I thought, oh my gosh, I am just, I am toast here. Um, but it, it's really, so it's really, really, really competitive, and it's a lot of fun. Hi. Um, I was wondering if, you, oh, it's right here. Oh, right here, right there. Right there. Sorry. Ahead. Sorry. I was wondering if uh, you had encountered in your research a book by Viktor Frankl. Oh, yeah. Man's Man Search. Search for Meaning. Exactly. Yeah. And his, his thesis was that the people that survived the Nazi concentration camps were people that had a clear sense of a meaningful future. Right. And I, I was wondering if you could speak on that. Yeah, no, he, I mean, that was really, this, he is really the father of this whole purpose in life, um, you know, extravaganza that we're seeing in psychology right now. Yeah, I mean, here, you know, there was one part of the book where he's trying to decide whether to trade his bowl of soup you know, he was worried about whether he could trade a bowl of soup for cigarettes or how he was going to escape a particularly brutal guard. And he suddenly realized that these were really small thoughts, the thoughts of an a, a caged animal, and that he had, to, he had to surpass that. He had to transcend that. And what he began to do is he began to think about two things. He did not yet know that his wife had died, uh, had been already killed in the camps. But, um, but he thought about her a lot and about what their lives meant and her, his love for her. But he also would picture himself lecturing to a group of students, college or graduate students, about the psychology of the, can, uh, the concentration camps. He would actually envision that life beyond these camps. 
And he came up with this whole theory about, about purpose, about man's search for meaning. And uh, it's so moving, and it's been so if influential in psychology today. Thank you. I have a comment and a question. I think it's very encouraging your strategy, and I'm substituting something like where you said you couldn't run anymore, now you cycle. Uh, I can't do 50 miles like you said, but because I have COPD and AFib, but I'm, gonna, I'm thinking now get an electric assist bicycle so I can extend my range. <laughs> and it's a very encouraging strategy you have. And my question is, what is spinning? You say you spin in the winter. What is spinning? Oh, spinning? Spinning is, uh, oh, it's just so much fun. I'm so addicted to it. Spinning is you go into a gym and they have a spinning coach and all these cycles there and you spin in place. And there's usually a lot of music and they are brutal. These people, you know, they should have been, they should have been um, sergeants in the army, right? They're like drill sergeants in the army. They're brutal. But, uh, these coaches, but yeah, you really get in shape. I thought I was gonna die. I thought I was gonna have a heart attack the first time I did it. But then you get kind of addicted and it's a lot of fun. Another good thing, of course, is swimming as you get older. I can't stand swimming, but I know I'm gonna have to like it eventually. Uh, and uh, and I'm, I'm resigned, I'm getting myself resigned to that fact. Good evening, thanks for coming and sharing all this with us tonight. Uh, my question is about like resiliency. Is there any, from your research, was there huh. any um, difference in men and women? Uh, that's interesting. Uh, actually, that's a great question, um, and I didn't talk about that at all. Um, there isn't, th we haven't seen, th they don't find differences between men and women, um, but the resilience research is really, really interesting. Um, I learned about, I did my book, I wrote my book first person because what happened is I essentially, I figured out all, all of the important things, midlife brain, midlife you know, career, all this stuff, marriage, friendship, blah, blah, blah. And when bad stuff happens was one of the chapters because bad stuff happens in midlife. It tends to you know, more and more happen in midlife. And, and um, right after my friend challenged me to try to train for the senior games, I got a new bike and promptly fell off and broke my collarbone. So that was my resilience chapter. Um, and uh, which set me back uh, in my research, you can't drive, you can't dry your hair, you can't type, you can't do anything. You can't open the mayonnaise jar with a broken collarbone. And it set me back in my research. Um, but I studied the resilience research and it was really interesting. And one interesting thing to know about resilience is that we are so much more resilient than we, we would ever think. Uh, uh, a researcher named George Bonanno at uh, Chicago um, has looked at people who've gone through really traumatic things like losing a limb or a spinal cord injury, even losing a child or more mild things, you know, losing a spouse. I mean, that's not mild, but it's not like losing a child. Um, seeing a terrorist event, you know, the 9-11, all of this stuff. And what he's found is that something like 90% of people return after, they, they return to essentially where they were in terms of their happiness beforehand. Now, 10% do get kind of post-traumatic stress syndrome and they get, you know, they do get depressed, but most people cope extremely well. We are really resilient people. Uh, the, um, another, another thing to know is that um, resilience, well, what I kind of learned uh, with resilience is that there are certain things that you can do that really help. Like, like right now, the University of Pennsylvania is training army sergeants um, resilient so they can pass it down to their, um, to their men and women so that they can kind of be prepped for resilience before they, this awful thing happens. They see their buddy blown up or something awful like that. And what they find is that there are certain things that you can do. You can read about it. I won't talk about them all, but you know, one of them is to, um, is to not catastrophize. So for me, what that meant was, you know, I break my collarbone and suddenly I can't do travel for research and all of that, and suddenly I'm spiraling, like, oh my goodness, I can't travel, oh my goodness, I'm gonna lose all my interviews, I'm gonna blow by my book contract, oh my goodness, I'm gonna be homeless, right? It goes right there, <laughs> homelessness, poverty, right? Well, that's ridiculous, and so you begin to focus not on, on catastrophizing, but you, you begin to think about what can, I, what can I control? The other interesting thing is that a little bit of trauma is just what the doctor ordered. So people who have absolutely no trauma in their lives are much more sensitive to bad events and much more likely to have lower well-being than people who have had two or three 
kind of major traumatic events. And by that, I don't mean you know being raped as a child. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about real setbacks. Um, so actually, it's a whole area of re resilience research called hardiness or stealing, um, S-T-E-E-L-I-N-G, right? Um, that it's actually really good to have bad stuff happen because you get a perspective and you say, you know what? I've been here before. I know what to do. I can handle this. This is great. But as to your question about men and women, no, um, there, there doesn't seem to be a difference. Optimists seem to do better. Um, it seems to be both biological and kind of psychological, but there doesn't seem to be a gender difference. What is your purpose was her question. And my, that will have to be the My last purpose question. is to make people reimagine their lives. That's my purpose right now. I, I actually, it is actually a purpose. Um, with my first book, my purpose was to try to figure out if there's, if we're crazy to believe in something more than this. And I thought that was helpful to people to just kind of walk them through the science and walk them through the faith. And this, in this case right now, you know, my purpose is, is actually to write write books that help people and make them really journalistically sound and I hope interesting to read that where people will actually feel enlivened. That's right now, that's my purpose. It changes, right? We all change purposes all the time. Um, but right now, that's my purpose. What a nice way to close. I think our purpose is to give Barbara Bradley Haggerty a nice round of applause. Thank you.